Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. I'm Scott Delman. I'm ACM's Director of Publications and also serving as Chair of Crossref. Um, what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so is the model that ACM uh, created and, uh, and launched in early 2020. We actually went live with this model uh, at the end of January last year, right at the beginning of the pandemic, so perfect timing. Um, but before I jump into the details, I'm going to just quickly show you a little bit of information about ACM to set some context, um, which you can see on your screen. Um, we're one of the oldest and, and, uh, and largest computing societies in the world and, um, and are very much a, a scholarly publisher. I would say as a, as a scholarly publisher, probably considered a mid-sized publisher um, and very much a, a member organization that runs um, conferences, publications, and member benefits as well. Uh, next slide, Howard. A um, little bit of context about our publications program. Um, ACM runs its own digital library, which consists of full text and bibliographic data uh, for everything that we publish. And we also uh, run a bibliographic database called the Guide to Computing Literature, which is a Scopus-like database of, of roughly more than 3 million records. Um, we are publishing about 20 to 25,000 full text articles per year, um, just to put in context what, what we do. Next slide. So um, th this session has really been framed as, as experimentation in OA, although I think um, for ACM, we're, we're a bit past experimentation at this point. Um, we've made a decision as an organization that uh, within a five-year time frame, ACM will become an open access publisher uh, and, and we'll be using the ACM open model that I'm gonna talk about this morning um, as one of the main paths to get to that future. Um, but there's a very clear timeline uh, and we are about a year, year and a half into this transition and things seem to be going very well. Um, the, the, the two things that really are kind of sitting at, at, at sort of the top of the, the, uh, the, goal, the goal pyramid for us are to create a publication program uh, that can be innovative, uh, that will better serve the research community and our membership than uh, the subscription model uh, has served in the past by, uh, by opening up our publications, and putting them in front of the paywall and making sure that they get more visibility, more usage, more impact on the community. Um, but of course, to do this in a sustainable way and sustainability is really at the heart of everything that we do here. Howard, next slide. So um, first and foremost, uh, a, bit, a little bit about ACM's publications program. Um, we're about a 20 to $25 million publishing operation. Um, and if you look on the expense side, um, we're a similar number. So we're not generating an enormous uh, surplus or profit. We are a nonprofit society publisher. And so when we developed this ACM open model, it was really um, a uh, built from a, a perspective of cost sustainability, making sure that we have enough income over the long term to continue our, our publishing operations and serving our membership. One of the key infrastructure elements that we found very early on several years ago when we started developing this model was, uh, was the need to really have a clear understanding of our finances and to drill down to understand exactly what it costs to publish a research paper, a non-research paper, a magazine paper, uh, and taking all of the various costs and expenses uh, and overheads into consideration. So we set about doing that in, uh, in 2019 um, and uh, that culminated in uh, in work with a group of universities uh, that we work very collaboratively with, Iowa State University, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Minnesota, and the University of California. Um, and once we started uh, developing the model, we really understood, we wanted to understand um, what sustainability meant for ACM, because we everyone uses that term, but for ACM, it has a very specific meaning. And when you look at your finances, you understand that one publisher is very different from every other publisher. For ACM, what that means is at, at a very base level that as we transition to OA, we need to, um, we need to be able to generate approximately 23 to $24 million a year. So everything is stemming from, from that piece. Um, infrastructure question for us was, how do we get at all of this data? We're a relatively small operation in terms of staff and resources. And so quite a lot of effort was put into understanding exactly what that financial picture looked like, 
Once we did that, um, we decided to be totally transparent about it to the community um, because uh, sustainability for us, of course, we wanted to convey what that means to, uh, to the institutional partners that we were working with and also to uh, prospective customers down the road. So we published an article in our flagship. Uh, it was distributed in May of 2020. Uh, and if anybody's interested in seeing what that, that article looks like, I'm happy to send that. Uh, just send me an email. Howard, next slide. A um, couple of screenshots of, of uh, that article, um, details on you know, where the revenues and expenses for ACM come from. This is going to be fundamental uh, to understanding the model a bit. Uh, next slide, Howard. And then next slide as well, and we'll jump off of the, these screenshots. So the, the next piece for us in developing the model was really understanding two different elements. On the one hand, um, what, what did the publication data look like? Where were published articles coming from? Uh, what institutions in particular were affiliated with those authors? Uh, and, and understanding this at a very deep level. And I will say for, for ACM, uh, the infrastructure challenge that we have here is probably the most significant that we've faced over the last two years um, in developing the model and, and continuing to run this model, uh, hopefully long into the future. And so, um, you know, what I would say is uh, as a mid-sized publisher, um, it, it took us quite some time to get at this level of, of data um, and it's not perfect. And so one of the things, the key elements uh, that we found is um, that author name normalization and institutional name normalization, the author data, metadata, and the institution data and metadata um, are, are not perfect. And that is for a variety of reasons, um, but more than anything else, it's a, it's a question of creating a workflow in your production system as a publisher that makes sure that the metadata is clean and comprehensive. Um, we publish around 20 to 25,000 articles a year, but we still have um, somewhere between two and 4,000 articles a year that we can't assign to a particular institution um, because the data itself is not clean because the met metadata wasn't assigned at the publication stage. So, um, so that's one of the, kind of the key elements I think other, other publishers would probably uh, agree with. On the right side, and what you're looking at on the left side of course is ultimately what we came up with was a list of roughly 5,000 institutions that, uh, that publish with ACM and we were able to assign the vast majority of those uh, to a particular institution. And, and that's relevant, of course, for our business model. On the right side of the screen um, is data relating to, uh, to your customers. And so uh, in particular, uh, what institutions are, are publishing papers with us and what institutions are paying. And one of the fundamental things that we found, one of the challenges that we found at the beginning was, uh, was that the place where our content was coming from, the, the, the institutions authoring papers for ACM um, did not very well line up with, uh, with where the vast majority of our revenues were coming from. Um, put simply, we have around 2,700 institutional customers uh, and those institutions are generating all of our publications revenue. Uh, and yet when you look at where the publications come from, the vast majority, over 80 to 85% of those publications come from the top one third. When we looked at our revenues, about 70% of our revenues were coming from the bottom two thirds. So institutions that are consuming content, but are not creating content. And that's a fundamental challenge for us. And really, um, I think for any publisher that's building a sustainable business model for open access, you really need to understand that at a pretty detailed level for any kind of a read and publish model. Um, it may be a bit different for a subscribe to open model, but this is really fundamental for us. So next slide, Howard. The model itself um, is what we're calling an unlimited access and unlimited publication model. So we are not APC based uh, in the sense that we're not charging authors APCs. Uh, and uh, we are, when we say unlimited, um, we charge essentially a flat fee um, on an annual basis to an institution. And that is based, that fee is based on a tiering structure uh, that's ultimately based on publication history. So looking at the number of articles that have historically come out of an institution. Um, no fees to authors is sort of a fundamental tenet. Uh, Multi-year arrangements 
uh, Creative Commons licensing, the ability to deposit uh, versions of record and accepted manuscripts into an institution's institutional repository. Um, and then of course, uh, keeping, keeping tiering flat for an institution over the, the term of that agreement and then using the publication data as it progresses over time to determine future tiering. Howard, next slide. Um, what you're looking at here is, is the basic model. So these are the 10 tiers, uh, largest to smallest. You're looking at the tier prices, which we're extremely transparent about. One of the, the, the key tenets of the model is global pricing. So in a subscription world, you would see um, you know, 100 different types of prices depending and discount structures depending upon which country you're selling into. Uh, but with the ACM open model, what we found is that we really want like institutions to pay the identical prices, no matter where those institutions are in the world. So we've created this sort of global tiering model that's based on article output. Um, and you can see roughly in that fourth column, approximately for ACM, um, where, where that content is coming from uh, in terms of numbers. Roughly speaking, about 80 to 85% of what we publish comes from what is represented here on this slide as tiers one through nine, with that long tail being uh, tier 10. Um, tier 10 is in red, uh, and that's because there's a great deal of uncertainty around what will happen when those smaller institutions that consume content but don't actually produce content for ACM, uh, when the vast majority of what we publish is sitting in front of a paywall, what happens to that tier 10? Will those institutions cancel? Uh, will those institutions stay on? I think this question is very relevant, of course, for Richard when Richard talks about subscribe to open because those are some of the same challenges that we're faced with, I think, with the subscribe to open model. Howard, next slide. Um, important to keep in mind that uh, what, what we've found is that um, as a result of the model and rebalancing uh, the, the pricing and the revenues from where, uh, right now, where the consumers are to where the producers of content are, it means that the top roughly one third of our institutional customers are being asked to pay more than they currently pay today because they're also, they're publishing the most content. Um, for the bottom two thirds, that means that they will actually pay less. And part of our thinking with that tier 10 was, well, to mitigate the risk of cancellation, uh, we, we are gonna be reducing pricing quite dramatically over time. And we're doing that at thresholds of openness. So as more and more of our publications become open access as a result of the model, um, those institutions that aren't producing content will pay less and less. And so you see this sort of ramp down schedule and pricing um, and, and that hopefully will lead to greater sustainability. And the next slide, Howard. Some financial term, uh, non-financial terms, um, of course, fixed pricing. Uh, we've decided not to go with the APC model uh, for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, quite frankly, is library budgeting. Um, libraries, when they're doing their annual budgets for periodicals, they really need to understand what, what they're gonna be paying. And because article counts seem to go up and down from year to year, um, and in some cases will go up dramatically from one year to another, um, the, the predictability aspect of this was really key for, for our institutional partners. And so that, that really was the basis for um, putting into place this unlimited, this unlimited model. Um, automatic deposits, uh, regular reporting, and of course, being extremely transparent on, on our financials and really making it clear that ACM isn't using this model to grow its surpluses and grow its profitability, but we're using the model to, to, to really create a sustainable open access future. Next slide, Howard. So um, another oh, aspect- I'm about to wrap up. I'm about to wrap up, okay. So um, some of the infrastructure, let me just kind of go through a very quick list of the key infrastructure pieces for us um, that, that we had as, as a major challenge. Publication data, financial data, developing in-house reporting systems because those reporting systems don't exist outside the organization, doing institutional repository deposits um, and setting up the infrastructure for those. Usage statistics, of course, this is something that's been you know, in the works for many years and counter deals with that, but um, really being clear about what content is open access and what's not open access is a challenge. Invoicing systems, developing these in-house, having systems that are available outside that you can work with. Um, completely re rejiggering or reworking uh, your production workflows um, and, uh, and, and sort of being more, let's say more aggressive about 
using uh, institutional identifiers, uh, using author identifiers like ORCIDs, mandating those identifiers, uh, and using the institutional identifiers like the ROR database um, are all gonna play a major role. Um, I will say that the business models tend to be uh, simple by comparison. The infrastructure issues are significant and even two years in for ACM developing a lot of this work in-house, um, it's, it's still a significant effort. So with that, I'll hand it back to David and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, through the, through the Q&A as we go. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Scott. Um, um, yeah, if you can just check on the Q and A, then there's, I, I had one quick question. When you're talking about identifying authors, you're focusing on the corresponding author, not all authors of the paper. Yeah, I mean, we we certainly look at both uh, categories. So on the one hand, um, the model itself and the tiering is based on just uh, corresponding articles, corresponding authors that are are, are affiliated with those institutions. Um, we also look at all affiliated authors, and we have that data as well, um, because we, we do provide as part of the model um, automatic deposits of accepted manuscripts for all of the co-authored articles that are not corresponding for an institution. So if, if an MIT, which is a participant in, in, in the pilot, uh, has um, you know, lots of co-authors of a work where the corresponding author is not from MIT, um, that we certainly will send them a version of the work to put into their IR. Uh, 